So the purpose of discussing the tight binding model is that we would like to introduce the concept of bands and through that band magnetism. So if you remember the mental chart that we drew in the other lecture, we would like to talk about Stoner model which describes band magnetism but that requires a discussion of the Hubbard model. But the Hubbard model requires a discussion of the tight binding model. So we've already looked at tight binding inside a molecule. Now we would like to look at a chain. Suppose we have a chain of atoms. separated by lattice constant A and we have N of these atoms and there is only one say orbital per atom whatever the orbital is this is just a schematic representation of an orbital and there is one electron per orbital per unit cell the unit cell is just one atom so it's a monatomic chain now what we would like to do, if we would like to represent the electrons belonging to an orbital, belonging to an atom by the state n. For example, this could be ket1, ket2, ket3, ket4 and so on. And if you were to write the Hamiltonian for this system, h, for a single electron, we will have a kinetic energy of course, k, plus we'll have a potential energy term which is the interaction of the electron with each of the individual nuclei, correct? So that term is, could be represented as Pj, where J extends over the chain. All right. Now we would like to construct a solution to this Hamiltonian. So we propose a solution. And the solution that we propose is psi, which is a, some superpositions Cn of the n's. And the solution that we propose is of the following form E raised power minus i k n a n. over under n, where n is the number of atoms. So this is our ANSATS. This is the solution that we propose for the tight binding chain. So the Hamiltonian that we've written over here Energy and Cm. 
So this is the Schrodinger equation that we would like to solve. For that purpose, we need to find out the matrix elements of the Hamiltonian. Okay. So the matrix Ham elements will be the following. This is M. This is N. So this is one matrix element. So I can write this bra M K plus B N plus sum over all of J's. Okay, this is my Hamiltonian and I have N here. Now if I look at the first two terms, this atomic orbital is an eigenstate of K plus B N with some ground state energy E0. Alright, just like a hydrogen atom, just like one electron inside coupled to a nucleus. So, but then you have to take the overlap with M. So, if I perform this eigenvalue function, eigenvalue equation so that I have this operator acting on this, then I form the overlap with this, then this will give me E0 only when n equals m. And then I have to include other terms. j is not equal to n and I have n bj n. So now I have to see what this term is going to be. The only constraint is that I am adding up all the terms for which j is not equal to n. Let me raise the voice for this little bit. I could have this term 
Now this represents a transfer of the electron or a hopping of the electron or a tunneling of the electron from one side to a neighboring side. Now m is not equal to n and it could be different kinds of m is not equal to n. One possibility is that I only include nearest neighbor interactions. That is n is not equal to m but m equals n plus minus 1. So this will give me a certain scalar, a complex number and I call that complex number minus t. t is a complex number. So in the condition that n is not equal to n but n equals n plus minus 1 which means I am allowing hopping between nearest, near, nearest neighbors only then this mixed term will become minus t and I will have 0 otherwise that is m is not equal to n and m minus m is greater than 1. That is, I do not allow transfer between non-nearest neighbors. So this is, these are my constraints on, on the term that I have written at the end. Yeah, nearest neighbor. Okay, for the nearest neighbor, so the electron can hop from this side to this side, which means that this is non-zero. This transfer is non-zero. This term is going to be non-zero. But the electron cannot hop from this side to this side because the transfer falls off exponentially as you increase the distance between the sides. So these are my constraints on the second term that I've written over there. Now under these constraints, the Hamiltonian HMN, a particular term of the Hamiltonian will become E0 delta MN plus this term V cross delta MN minus t delta m n plus 1 plus delta m n minus 1. So this is a term in my Hamiltonian. I can also write this as E0 plus V cross delta m n minus t delta m n plus 1 plus delta m n minus 1. This is called the tight binding Hamiltonian for a chain. Now if you look at this Hamiltonian, this is some constant. This object is some constant. I can also call this constant E0 dash. All right. Now this Hamiltonian is quite interesting. <coughs> <coughs> now that I have the form of the type binding Hamiltonian, I can use this element to solve the Schrodinger equation with my answer, with, with my trial solution. So I found out an element of the Hamiltonian. If I know the Hamiltonian, I can solve the Schrodinger equation because I would like to find out the dispersion relationship. So this is my Hamiltonian. That's my Schrodinger equation. So I will insert this matrix element into the Schrodinger equation and find out a dispersion relationship. That's what I'm going to do now. So I take the left-hand side of the Schrodinger equation. sum of over m of h m n which is e naught prime delta m n minus t delta m n plus 1 plus delta m n 
minus 1. Now this acts on Cn. Cn, my trial solution is 1 over under root n e raised power minus i k n a. This is the coefficient of my trial solution. <coughs> Right. Now I can solve this. I can expand this with 1 over under root n. I'm taking a sum over all n's. But n, I'm picking up the value of n which is equal to m. So the first term will give me e naught prime e minus i k m a minus t. I'm picking up the value of n, which is m equal to m minus 1. So this term becomes e raised for minus i k m minus 1 k. Here I'm picking up that value of m, which is equal to m plus 1. So I get e minus i k m plus 1 k. See, I'm summing up over all n's, but n must be equal to m, otherwise it's 0. Here n must be equal to m minus 1, otherwise it's 0. Here n must be equal to m plus 1, otherwise it's 0. So I'm just sampling one particular value of n. It has the correct form. So this gives me e raised for minus i k m a over under root n e naught prime minus t e i k a plus e minus i k a. Okay, this gives me e minus i k m a over under root n e naught prime minus 2t cosine of k a. But this must equal to the right hand side and the right hand side is simply e times e minus i k m a over under root m where e is the energy. Hence I automatically get the dispersion relationship. I compare this e with this. This is my energy as a function of k. So the dispersion relationship for a tight binding chain E, which is H bar omega, turns out to be E naught prime minus 2T cosine of Ka. This is the dispersion relationship. I can plot this. This is K. Now on this axis, if I were to plot E minus E naught prime, okay, this is just a constant of energy, so it doesn't really matter. So what I would like to plot is E minus E naught prime versus K. I have a cosine of K A function. And when I make these plots, I plot in the first Brillouin zone, this is pi over a, this is minus pi over a. And when I draw this plot, I get a cosine function which is inverted. I get this. So this represents my dispersion relationship for, for a tight binding chain. Okay, now this is something really interesting. Remember, this is the first groin zone. The first groin zone. And these are all the possible k values. And this is how the k, with the k values, the energy is going to change for the system. Now, depending upon the number of electrons that are available, these different k states will be populated. This is called a band. This is a band of k values. 
and it represents a band of energies. The range of those energies spans from minus 2 T to plus 2 T within the Brillouin zone. So the bandwidth of this band is 4 T. This is the spread of this band in units of energy. This is 4 T. It's a one dimensional, so it's 4 times T into 1. For a 2D, it's going to be HT. For a 3D, it's going to be 12T. So the bandwidth of this band is 4 times T, where T is some hopping parameter. Okay? If T is large, the bandwidth is large. So now a band has formed. And if you look at this band, we can approximate it for long wavelength. We can come up with a nice understanding. If K is small, which means the temperature is low or the wavelength is large, for the electrons inside this type binding chain, then I can replace cosine K A with no with cosine Ka will be 1 plus Okay, what I could do is the following So for the, in the long wavelength regime, with K A is much smaller than one, I can have write the energy as E naught prime minus T two plus T two one minus cosine K A. So this is just some constant E naught minus T two. E naught prime minus C will get some constant. So this is some constant C plus 2T, 1 minus cosine K is 2 times sine square K A over 2. This is C plus 4T. Now this term becomes K square A square over 4. So barring this constant factor, the energy is some constant plus k square a square t. So at the bottom of this band, if you look at this band, at the bottom of the band, the band has a parabolic shape. So it's parabolic here where the energy goes as the square of k. So at the bottom of the band, the energy is parabolic. The, the dispersion relationship is parabolic. Since it's parabolic, you might assume that you can treat the electrons to be free electrons because free electrons live in parabolic bands with a changed effective mass. We know that for free electrons, the energy is h bar square k square over 2m. So if you were to represent these electrons by free electrons in the long wavelength regime, then we can define an effective mass. Okay? That effective mass turns out to be the following. h bar square k square over 2m star equals k square a square t. So the effective mass is h bar square over 2a square t. So electrons inside the tight binding have an effective mass that is proportional to the inverse of the hopping parameter. It's not a real mass, it's an effective mass. Okay, if the hopping parameter is large, you will have light electrons. The effective mass of those electrons will be drop. So, so in a tight binding model, the, at the bottom of the band, you will have 
a parabolic dispersion equation. All right. Now, how do, where do we go from here? Now, look at this type, but look at this band here. Okay, if I plot the band, it's a cosine curve, particular dispersion relationship. Okay. Phonons will have a certain band structure. Magnons have a certain band structure. In a tight binding model, the electrons will have a certain band structure. And this is what the band structure looks like. Now, this range is from minus pi a to pi a, if this is the k axis. Now, the spacing between two consecutive levels we know is going to be equal to 2 pi over L because the k value is quantized. Now, we would like to find out how many k values exist inside the band. So, the number of k values inside the band is 2, this total length is 2 pi over A. So this is 2 pi over a divided by the width of each k value, which is 2 pi over l. This is l over 2 pi. This is l over a, where l is the length of the chain. So what is l over a equal to? L is the length of the chain, a is the size of the unit cell. is the number of unit cells, the number of atoms inside this chain, n. Now if you have a monovalent atom in which one atom donates one electron, how many electrons can the complete band fit? 2n. Because two electrons can have the same value of k and have this thing opposite. So if you have a monovalent atom such as sodium or one valence electron is available, it will only be half filled. Alright? So you get a half filled band for monovalent atoms in this simple model. If you just have one orbital per atom and one electron, you can have as many electrons, but depending upon the kind of the orbit. Okay? So now this band is half filled, so you have a half filled band. Now if you apply an electric field, the electrons can increase their energy in response to the electric field. So if you, so remember this represents a direction, K is a direction. So if you apply electric field in a particular direction, the electrons can go up here because this region of the band is empty. So the electrons can climb in their energy. So if there are electrons available here and there are nearby unoccupied levels inside the band, the electrons can go there because the electric field is trying to apply a force that's trying to increase the energy of the electrons. So what's going to happen is that just like a snake, this portion of the band is going to move downwards from here and it's going to go up over there. So on the two sides of the one dimensional chain, there's a lowering of the Fermi le level here and the raising of the Fermi level here. And because of this difference in Fermi level, the current starts to flow. So when you apply an electric field to a half filled band, it can conduct electricity. So you have a gradient in the, in the Fermi level. The Fermi level is low here and high here. And the electron being negatively charged particles can go from a low Fermi level to a high Fermi level because they move uphill. Negatively charged particles move uphill. So this is how current flows. And this is where you get a conductor. This is what a conductor is. If on the other hand, you have in this simplistic model in which just one band is available. Okay? And you have a divalent atom. So each atom is donating two electrons to the orbit. 
So there are two n electrons and there are n k sites, n values of k. So on each k there is going to be two electrons with opposite spins to obey the Pauli exclusion principle. So this band is going to be completely filled. Now if you apply an electric field, the electrons don't have any place to go, go because the band is already completely filled. There is no nearby unoccupied level that's available. So this is what is called a band insulator or an insulator. An insulator is formed. And no conduction can take place. Hall conductivity can take place, but that's a separate issue. So you get a band insulator or an insulator. Now the question is the following. <coughs> This tight binding chain has given us a band. All right. Now, the, in the molecule, if you move back to the molecule, to the example of the molecule, and we saw the tight binding hamiltonian for the molecule, if this is a separation between the nuclei, we know that far away you get the atomic orbitals, correct? And when you move closer, which means that the overlap P goes up, then you get level here and you get level here. One of them you call the bonding molecular orbital, the other you call the anti-bonding molecular orbital. So you get this divergence of energies, all right? Now in this particular case, you are getting, now there are two possible energies. Here you are getting a spread of energies, a band of energies, because you have a large number of atoms inside the chain. Alright? So, <clears throat> so remember that as you are decreasing the separation, you are increasing the magnitude of P. So this is what we studied for a molecule. Now let's come back to our chain. Suppose each atom harbors two kinds of orbitals. All right. Now what's happening in this case here is that you're getting a certain bandwidth of energies, a certain spread of energies. So in this case, what's happening is that if I have the separation on this axis, let's call the separation R. Okay? Now if you far apart, if A is large, which means P is small, if P is really, really small, then this bandwidth, this thing, the 4P is really small. So you do not get any fanning off the energy levels. However, if the atoms get closer together and there are a large number of atoms available, then this unperturbed energy, E0 prime, is going to spread out or fan out into a band of energies. This is going to be equal to 40. So this bandwidth is 40. As you decrease the separation, R goes down, T goes up, and the energy spread goes up. To form a band. This is the case for a single orbital. Suppose that orbital is 2s, is called the 2s orbital. Yes. This is your A here. This is a separation, this is a lattice constant, A. Okay. Now suppose you have another orbital attached to the same atom. So with, the, with each atom there are two orbitals. One is a 2s orbital and the other is a say 2p orbital. The 2p orbital on, in isolation will have a different energy, probably a higher energy. So when you move these atoms closer together, you decrease the lattice Spacing, then this orbital can also fan out and give you a band. 
So you have this kind of structure. Now, if you are below a certain regime, if the spacing between the atoms is below a certain critical value, some A critical, the 2S and the 2P bands, as they are called, will now overlap. So if I were to draw a, a graph corresponding to the dispersion relationship that I've drawn over there for this case, for A less than A critical, this is what I would like to draw. The 2S band looks like this. Okay? And the 2P band looks like this. Now, if this is the Fermi level over here, if this is my Fermi level, the Fermi level, by the way, could be anywhere, depending upon the number of electrons. Now, if this is my Fermi level, then there are two S and two P levels that have the same energy. So, the electrons will be shared between the two S and the two P valence electrons. So, in other words, the two S and the two P bands will be hybridized. So the electrons can share time between the 2s and the 2p bands because both of these bands have the same energy. They are within the same energy structure. So suppose you had this kind of configuration in which the 2s band is completely filled. So the 2s band can be completely filled by two electrons. So each atom carries two electrons. So if you have the 2s band completely filled. So this is completely filled. You have an insulator up to this point. At this point, at the critical point, the insulator transitions into a metal because now there is a 2P. Now the band is all of this. So unoccupied levels become available. So at this point, you have an insulator to metal transition. So you can describe insulator to metal transitions using the tight binding model. So this point represents an insulator to metal transition. All right. Now let's. Suppose, how do we form band gaps? If you have a chain in which there are two kinds of atoms in the unit cell, like in the atomic chain, then the kind of band structure that emerges if you solve the tight binding model is the following. So this is the k axis, this is pi over a, this is minus pi over a. Okay. Then at the boundary of the belonging zone, a gap opens up. and you get another band. So this is called the extended zone scheme. If you would like to uh, displace these bands through the reciprocal vector, this part will come here and this part will come here and you can form the reduced zone scheme. So at these edges of the belonging zone, these gaps open up. These are called band gaps. Okay? If this band gap is larger than 4 electron volts, generally it's called insulated. If it's less than 4 electron volts, it's generally called a semiconductor. So this is how bands and band gaps are formed. This is a general framework. This is an intuitive picture of how these bands are formed. Now this has implications for magnetism as well. So, 
once we have talked a little bit about the tight binding model, we would like to talk about magnetism now. And we would like to introduce another model on top of the tight binding model, which is called the Hubbard model. Any questions of, about these points? So, so far in our discussions, we have ignored the interaction between electrons. Right? So, the electrons will be attracted to nuclei, but what about the interactions between the electrons themselves? So, this gives rise to the physics of correlated electronic systems, which is a very complicated undertaking because it's a many body physics problem and it also forms the basis of the application of quantum field theory in condensed matter systems. And we can also use the second quantization formalism to discuss the Hubbard model and probably I need to upload those notes as, as an A site for you to, to study. However, what we would like to introduce now is some kind of interaction between the electrons on top of the tight binding model. One model that's proposed is the Hubbard model. Alright? Suppose that the number of electrons per site is x. Because that is disallowed by Pauli's union principle. 
So if those spins want to be parallel, you would like to have a magnetization, then the kinetic energy of the system is going to be really high. This means that ferromagnetism is a highly unfavorable circumstance because that raises the kinetic energy of the band electrons. Do you agree with me on that? Because in ferromagnetism, you have a magnetized sample, all the spins are parallel. So they must be on different sides, otherwise the Pauli exclusion principle will be uh, set, will be uh, jeopardized. So you want the spins to be parallel, they must be on different sides. And if they are on different sides, then it raises the kinetic energy of the system. Because they have to go to different k values, they must have different k values then. Because when they are on the same side, they have the same k value, they will have opposite spins. So the energy of the system is going up, which means that due to purely energetic consideration, if you don't take into account any interactions, there can be no ferromagnet. So now Hubbard, Hubbard's model resolves this anomaly. What Hubbard proposed is a Hamiltonian, H. Hubbard, which is given by Ni plus spin up and i spin minus sum over all the sides this is Hubbard's proposal it's a model so it's a proposal what does this mean and, and a certain parameter u ok a certain constant u what does this mean and i plus or ni up is the number of electrons will spin up on site i. Okay? This is the number of electrons on site i will spin down. So you multiply the two. This is like an interaction between the electrons. When you talk about electrostatic repulsion between electrons, you have an e square over 4 pi epsilon naught r term or you multiply the two charge density. So this is like a Coulombic repulsion between the two electrons. This term represents the strength of the Coulombic interaction between the two electrons. So if this is large and if this is large, then the two electrons are on the same side, which means that the energy of the system is going to go up. So this term actually wants the electrons to disperse. They want it would like the electrons to minimize their energy by, by delocalizing. This term does not want the electrons to delocalize. So there is a competition between the kinetic energy and the interaction between the two between any two electrons. Alright? So the overall energy has to be minimized. And you would like to see if the Hubbard model gives can give rise to magnetism. You see, one thing I would like to mention here, it's a slightly advanced concept. It's one of the most advanced concepts in, in our course. When we're discussing polyparamagnetism, free electrons, if this is my density of states, GE, this is my energy. When we talk about polyelectrons or electrons that are free, this is the Fermi energy, EF. We have alpha or up spin and we have beta minus spins. In the absence of a magnetic field, both of these spins subband with the same energy. Correct? So the material is not is not magnetic. It does not have a magnetic moment. And remember when we apply the magnetic field, the spins that are favorably aligned, their energy gets lower. So this band shifts lower, it goes down. And this band, which has the spins aligned in the wrong direction, goes up. So now you have a configuration in which there are more alpha spins than there are beta spins. And if you remember, this spacing is given by 2 mu b b. 
And from here we were able to calculate the susceptibility, which was called the poly susceptibility. So when you apply a magnetic field and you have these free wandering itinerant electrons, you can get a paramagnetism, paramagnetic term. This is called the poly paramagnetism. But in ferromagnets, you can have spontaneous magnetism. As we studied from our from the wise molecular field theory, you can have magnetization spontaneously inside this, even in the absence of a magnetic field. So how do we explain this? The Hubbard model helps us explain this. Okay? So now we would like to find out why is iron magnetic? Why is cobalt magnetic? And we would like to use the Hubbard model for that purpose. Okay? So this is the Hubbard Hamiltonian, the proposed Hubbard Hamiltonian. The question is how could we get a, a shifting of the spin subband or the spontaneous splitting of the spin subband in a ferromagnet, even in the absence of a magnetic field? There has to be some correlation between the electrons, some interaction between the electrons. Now I've already described that for if I have a perfectly saturated ferromagnet, it's a spin polarized state. All the electrons have spins that are parallel. Let's call the quantum state for such a ferromagnet C psi polarized. Now if I want to calculate the expectation value of the Hubbard Hamiltonian for such a state. 100% polarized state. What is this expectation value going to be? This must be 0 because this term is 0. The two electrons, any two electrons are parallel, so they must can never be on the same side, otherwise poly student principle is going to be violated. So this term is always zero for any pair of electrons in a perfectly polarized state, so this must be equal to zero. But that's going to increase the energy of the system, the H0 is going to go up because now the electrons are on different sides, they will have different K values, they cannot have the same K value. Because having the same value will force these things to be opposite. So they have all the spread of K values that are available in the band. So the kinetic energy of the system is going up. So why is this polarized state does it exist in the first place? Okay, so there is a competition between the kinetic energy and the correlation between the electrons. One is trying to increase the energy, the other is trying to lower the energy. We would like the overall energy to go down. That's what we would like to do. So we start our discussion from this Hubbard Hamiltonian and see how this can be achieved. <clears throat> so if you look at the Hubbard Hamiltonian, H, I'll write this as HH. This is U N I N I okay over all I. Now I can write this in the, in the following form U over 4 N I plus plus N I minus square minus N I plus minus N I minus squared for all i. Okay, I just do an algebraic manipulation. And I this equals this thing. Alpha square plus beta square, two alpha beta, this is alpha square plus beta square minus two alpha beta. So if I construct this sum, I get this. Now in the next step, I would like to apply a mean field approximation. A mean field approximation means that I would like to replace these 
Remember, in the quantum field theory, these are really operators, right? So I would like to replace these numbers by just average values. This is a mean field approximation. When you replace a number by an average value, okay? So I write this as u over 4. I get rid of the sigma sign because I'm doing a mean field uh, approximation. And I replace this with its average, ni plus plus ni minus And I don't need the i's here. Minus. Now what is this equal to? This is the average number of electrons per site. And i plus irrespective of the spin. So this is just x. Okay, so this thing is just x as I've defined it. This is the average number of electrons per site. Now this number here, it's the average difference between the spins that are pointing up and the spins that are pointing down. What is this related to? What is this average number related to in, in magnetic terms? You have spin up, spin down. If this is zero, the sample will be unmagnetized. If this is large, the sample will be magnetized. So this is really going to be proportional to the magnetization of the sample. Correct? Hence, I would like to write this in terms of the magnetization. The magnetization is if I'm talking about spin half particles, I'm taking g to be 2. So I get mu b is the moment of each spin in n i n n plus minus n minus. This is the net polarization, the difference between spin up and spin down on average, multiplied by the moment of each divided by some volume. Now this volume is the volume of the unit cell. Okay, so I call it small b. Okay, because each unit cell has one side. Each unit cell has one side. This is the magnetization. Alright. Now this means that now what is now this object is the energy of a single site, the Hubbard energy of a single site. Then this term decreases. 
the energy goes down. So this Hubbard Hamiltonian is of the right form. If the sample gets magnetized, then the energy of the system goes down. So there is one H naught tight binding Hamiltonian which likes to, like to increase the energy of the system. This energy would like to go down if the sample gets magnetized. So if M goes up, this is negative here. And the overall Hubbard energy, the energy associated with the interaction of the electron goes down. So if we include these interactions inside the system, then we might expect to get non-zero magnetization even in the absence of the magnetic field. Alright? Yes. Yes, so you have there's a competition. So there's a competition. So what we would like to minimize is the kinetic energy plus the energy associated with the Hubbard interaction. This is our total energy and we would like to minimize this. Alright, so this gives rise to so now that we've introduced the Hubbard model, we would like to introduce the next model, which probably we do in our last class on Wednesday, which is a stoner model. Based upon this, we would like to see how this model can give rise to magnetization for certain elements, and for certain elements, it does not give rise to magnetization. Why are iron, cobalt, and nickel in the 3D series? only the elements that can give rise to spontaneous magnetization. Alright? So this finishes our discussion of the tight binding model and the kind of Hubbard Hamiltonian that I wanted to introduce. The key is that the kinetic energy of the system goes up in if the, if the sample gets magnetized because the spins are now parallel. If Naively, you never expect a sample to get magnetized because that increases the energy of the system. But the Hubbard model comes to our rescue. The Hubbard model says that there are interactions between the electrons, a Coulombic repulsion between the electrons. That Hamiltonian is cast in the form of a model. That model tells us that if the magnetization goes up, the energy associated with the interaction between the electrons actually goes down. So, there is some ray of hope. We would like to see where is the balance and why does the balance tip in the favor of ferromagnetism for some elements and it tips against ferromagnetism for other elements inside the 3D series. Then we would like to answer why does iron have a non integer magnetic moment for formula unit 2.2 UV? Why is that the case? In fact, this Hubbard Hamiltonian can also describe super exchange, direct exchange, all kinds of all kinds of ex exchange interactions, all kinds of ferromagnetic exchanges. But this is something beyond the scope of this course because we really need the second quantization formalism for that. Anyway, we'll get a good idea of why iron cobalt and nickel is magnetic based upon the stoner criteria which derives from this Hubbard model. So on Thursday, uh, Wednesday we're going to have our last class, inshallah. And I'll upload it one homework. Start early with the homework. It's a lengthy homework. Inshallah, see you on Wednesday. Yes. Why was the assumption? Because it's a it's an independent electron model. The tight binding model by its very design is an independent electron model. It does not take into account the correlation. So you have to add on those correlations. start with simple models and then you add on more complications to get closer to reality in successively more sophisticated models. You have to minimize this energy with respect to M, with respect to X. Uh, you fix X and you minimize with respect to M. Okay. All right, thank you.
साहब सर प्लीज वीडियो ले ले यूएसबी है आपके पास